man, Brad, if that tries to come back, don't let it fight it. Just close to tell you. One of the things that, two of, there's two things in the scripture that we read, and, and mostly in verse 16, um, that talk about mercy and grace. And there's two different aspects of mercy and grace. That, um, mercy is, you know, we've, we've sang that song, uh, there's his, uh, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever I will sing. How many are thankful for God's mercy? Because that's basically mercy is receiving unmerited favor. Something, uh, when, when you go before a judge and he doesn't give you the sentence you rightfully deserve, he had mercy on you. And God says, I, I want you to be able to receive mercy from me so that you can give it. Did you hear that? God wants you to know how to receive mercy from God so that you can give mercy rather than judgment. You have every right to judge people's fruit, but you can't judge them as a person. You have every right to judge what, what comes out of your life. The Bible says that judge, judge, we judge fruit. We don't judge people. We judge the results of people's decisions and things, but we don't judge people, and we have to make sure we keep that correct. But when when God says He He uh, wants to extend to us mercy and grace, mercy is that unmerited favor, not getting what we deserve. Turn over to Matthew 15. That's a great example of mercy. Matthew 15. Matthew 15, verse 21. Let's begin reading there. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him crying, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. And Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, is it, not right? it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. He wasn't calling her a dog. She was a Gentile. And that's what the Gentiles were called, was dogs. And the children's bread were the Israelites, but their bread was fallen to the ground. And even the dogs, those that are maybe not of the Israelite community, can obviously come and receive off the master's table of the crumbs that come. But Jesus responded to her in a wonderful way. In verse 28, he said, Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. He extended mercy. Not what she rightfully deserved. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. But you see, isn't it interesting that sometimes when this woman could have gave up right away and not received mercy, not received a healing, but because she persisted in asking, and, and you know, the disciples were, you know, maybe there's somebody like that in your life, you would wish they would just quit asking. <laughs> this woman's bothering me. <laughs> Maybe you've got somebody like that in your life. Well, Jesus didn't respond right away, but he did reach out with mercy. And because of mercy, the kingdom of God was advanced because the demon lost his position. Isn't that good? And when the devil loses his position, guess what? God's kingdom grows. And that's what we want to see. We want to see God's kingdom grow. We want to see God's work continue to grow. And, and so this woman had faith. And as she had faith, guess what? Her request was granted because of God's mercy. Lamentations 3, verse 22 and 23 says this. It is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his great compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Remember the hymn? Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I lost the rest of it. But you know, it's, it's, 
aren't you thankful that God doesn't, you don't have to walk with God like you got a fuel tank, that if you drove yesterday, you've got less fuel, less mercy. Today's a brand new day, and he's got enough mercy for everything you need. Everything you and I need. He's got enough mercy to extend to us so we can, once again, be filled with mercy so that when I run across people that need mercy, not judgment, I can be merciful. And sometimes that's hard to do because there's people like this woman that will come and cause us to wonder, what is her problem? Why does she keep acting, or why does he keep acting like that? And what we need to sometimes, or many times, probably just extend mercy because she was a Gentile. She wasn't saved. You can't put sinners and saved in the same boat. You can't treat them the same. Why? Because they come from two totally different backgrounds. When you're dealing with a Christian, they understand some things. When you come with a non-Christian, they don't understand anything about God, other than maybe some stories they heard in Sunday school or on the way. So you have to, once again, treat people the, with where they've been, and if you don't know where they've been, be careful what you say to them. Because you might be treating them as a Christian when they have no idea who God is. And then what are you doing? You're being a poor farmer, where you plant seed but the soil is not ready. What's going to happen to that seed? It's going to fall to the ground and do nothing. And you're going to go, well, I witnessed today. Well, I witnessed today. I got to talk to God talking about Jesus. Oh, it's so wonderful. And God's going, yeah, but nothing happened. Because it was the soil wasn't ready. So be, be a good wise farmer. Be a good sower. Be a good seed sower where God wants you to plant seed. So it's important for us to recognize that. So his mercy is new every morning. You know, I wouldn't be a pastor if it wasn't for God's mercy. There's no way I'd be able to stand here. I need God's mercy every single day. And you do too. We're all in this boat together. We, we, we need God's mercy because if every one of us got what we deserved, wouldn't be any of us doing much. But because of God's mercy, because of his unmerited favor, because of him giving us what we don't rightfully deserve, he once again has the ability to, to pass on to us something that goes greater and deeper in our life. And so once again, the reason God would extend his mercy to you is to make sure that you extend mercy to one another. In the body of Christ, I don't know how many churches have divided over all kinds of things, but many times we have thrown judgment rather than mercy. No wonder churches aren't succeeding. No wonder people aren't growing. No wonder Christians are divided. It's because we're throwing the wrong thing at the wrong problem or the wrong situation. And many times I believe that we need to continue to grow in our understanding of God's mercy. He's drawing us. He's compassionate. He's drawing us. He, he can't wait for us to once again step into uh, watching God uh, help us to be like his son, be merciful when all the religious leaders were standing around ready to throw stones. God was still merciful. You and I want to be careful where we're ready to throw stones because you might be throwing it at Jesus. Did you ever think about that? If you, if you really think about it, if you you got a brother or sister that may not be acting right, right, you're ready to stone them, you're literally stoning Jesus. I don't think that's going to work for you. It doesn't work. So we have to be very careful. We have to get out of our emotions and get into the Spirit. We have to allow the Spirit of God to control us rather than our emotions. And you know as well as I do, we can get emotional. You put me on a wrestling mat or get me close to a wrestling I get emotional. I love watching that. I love watching on, on Josie that watches some of the same stuff I do. I love watching these guys and man, I just something inside of me rises up and says, "Man, I wish I could be out there." Then my then my body finally kicks up to my brain. <laughs> it says, "You're not that young anymore." <laughs> it might hurt. <laughs> That's probably true. Yeah, well, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, the reality is, is that there's some things in your in your body that you need to be in control of and not. Um, let them fly, not even on Facebook. Got real quiet. I, you know, I, I'm just as guilty as anybody. I gotta be careful what I do. We're not, we're not pointing the finger. We just got, 
we got to grow in this. It's time to grow out of our mercy, out of the mercy God gives us, and uh, the, then also uh, continue to grow in His grace. And uh, that's the next thing that I want you to look at is God's grace. Look at uh, Hebrews uh, 4 again. He says, let us then approach, verse 16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Isn't it interesting that when you come before God, you're not supposed to come with a, uh, uh, I'm not worthy. If you weren't worthy, God wouldn't have gave it to you. So to tell him you're not worthy is really kind of a, you're telling God what he said is not true. Because if I can't go to him with confidence, now that's not arrogance, that's not being, uh, you know, I'm going to tell God what to do. That's not what that's saying. You're, you're coming before God because you have Jesus Christ who made everything right for you to be able to stand before him. And then because of that, God will extend his grace to you to be able to run the race that you need to run while you're living here on earth. But without his mercy and his grace, you and I will never be able to accomplish that. So we need to look at what God's grace is. God's grace is, is this favor. And I don't know about you this morning, but as we were worshiping and just waiting in God's presence, uh, one of the songs that we sang had a line in it, and I wrote it down. And it says, your favor is my delight. Do you really long to, do, to have God's favor as your delight? That when you walk and you come across someone, you have the ability to extend God's mercy and grace and watch the favor of God pleasantly flow through you to them, where it literally changes their life. But it's my pleasure, Lord, to be the vessel you want to use today to touch Callie. It's my pleasure, Lord, to be the vessel you want to use to help pay her debts off or whatever it might be or to encourage her or whatever. That it's my pleasure to be uh, to have experience your favor. Because when I walk in agreement with what God wants to do, His favor is upon that. And when you have God's favor, guess what takes place? God is able to do more than He could without. So your favor is my delight. In other words, I don't want to do anything this morning without His favor. Otherwise, why do we come here? Why, do we, why are we doing this? Because we want to walk in God's favor. We want to walk with God's ability. Uh, you know, I don't know how many times I would be driving to Arlington, South Dakota, knowing that if I did what my mom and dad asked me to do, I would have their favor. But there was many times I was walking carefully because I knew that if I screwed this thing up, the favor would go right out the window. If I did something that wasn't what mom and dad wanted me to do, my favor would be lost. And I would have to regain that favor or their trust by doing what was right again. And that's the same way it is with God. I want to walk in God's favor. I want to walk in obedience to what he's doing. Why? Because I want to that to be the number one thing that I, that I live, in, live my life for. So it, sometimes it does affect me. Other times I'm tired and cranky and I let my flesh get in the way. And I don't, I don't get God's favor because of how I act or what I say or what I do. So that's why I have to go back and just apologize and repent and work harder at letting God continue to, to do a work in me. But God's grace means to inspire or to impart strength to endure a trial or resist temptation. Titus 2.11, turn over there with me, defines grace. I love this scripture. It's one of my favorites. Because I think grace many times has been misconstrued. That because of God's grace, I can go and do this and do this, and God's okay with it. No, it's not. God's grace means something totally different than that. Verse 11, Titus 2, verse 11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. In other words, God, through His grace, had made it possible for every single person in the sound of whatever gospel, whatever, whatever uh, country you're in, He made it possible for each and every person in that country to be able to walk in His grace and be saved. To be saved. Why? Because we didn't deserve it. 
He reached down. Jesus fulfilled everything so he could reach down and we could experience God's grace through salvation. And he appeared to all men. It teaches us, or God's grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives when? Yes. Now. Not someday in heaven. You're not going to need God's mercy, and you're not going to need God's grace in heaven. You need it now. I need it now. We need that work now in our lives, because when we watch God's mercy extended to us so I can be merciful, I also can watch God's grace do something in me that can't be done any other way. So I'm just going to pull some money out of the offering today, because I can. Okay, Aaron, Aaron. So, Aaron made a foolish choice. <laughs> Confession's good for the soul. <laughs> um, he, he got in debt. And uh, he's come to ask if, if I would help him. And so, out of my mercy, even though it was a foolish choice, I'm going to help pay his debt. So now, out of mercy, he's, his debt is free. But God not only works in mercy, but he also works in grace, doesn't he? Well, if grace empowers me to live an upright, self-controlled God life in this present age, he's going to need something to go on. He has nothing. He's broke. He's at zero. Yes, we paid his debt, but he's at zero. So what does God do when Jesus paid your debt and mine? We're at zero. But then he brings his Holy Spirit in and he deposits an ability for me to do something I couldn't do without being forgiven and empowered by the work of the Holy Spirit. And now I've not only canceled his debt, paid his debt, redeemed him. That's what redeem means, is to redeem is, is to buy back. Jesus bought him back. And now by God's grace, He's given him more than he had, so now he can do what he couldn't have done before. So that's God's grace. And God's grace means he reached down and helped us in our time of temptation, our time of, of difficulty. I've helped him in his time of power of being merciful to cover his debt through Jesus Christ. And now God has graced him to have the ability to do something he couldn't do before. So once you and I go to God and we receive His mercy, I'll be the recipient this time. No, nope, mercy. Mercy. Thank you. <laughs> See, because here's the thing. He can't give what He doesn't have. But now that He's received mercy, He can now extend mercy. And now He can also help be a, a person that just continues to demonstrate the grace of God. To To those around you. So once again, God's mercy and grace are powerful tools that God has given us. The sad part is, is that the church isn't very good at it. Because we're too, maybe self-righteous. Maybe we've got too many things standing in the way that cause us to think, hmm, wonder if that would be a wise decision. Well, God took a chance on you. Have you always walked perfectly? Not a chance. And God still extended his mercy and his grace because tomorrow morning when you wake up, you'll have a new mercy. You have a load of mercy. <laughs> oh, load of mercy. Yeah. He's catching up quick. <laughs> and then to help him through the day, God's grace will help him accomplish everything that he couldn't have done before. Yeah. Put that back in your mouth. <laughs> Thank you. So when you see God's mercy and grace come into your life through Jesus Christ, which you didn't deserve, now what are you going to do with God's grace? Remember 2 Corinthians 6, 1 says, Do not take God's grace in vain. If he had taken the, the extra money that he got above and beyond his mercy and used it for himself instead of using it for God, he would have took the grace of God in vain. 
And God wouldn't, wouldn't have been okay with that. But because we learn to hear God's voice when God has been merciful, we now can extend grace. And when God gives us that grace, what do I do with his grace so that I don't take it in vain? Then I can begin to be the, uh, the kind of person that God designed me to be. Uh, turn over, with, if you would, with me to uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Very familiar passage of scripture, but it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, isn't it interesting that kind of words are different, but if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Do you know that there's going to continue to be old stuff leaving you all the time? You're not a complete work just because you accepted Jesus Christ. There's old things that are going to continue to lead my life so that well, I can get rid of things that continually come up that I have to repent over or I give to God or whatever the case might be so that when, uh, when I'm ready, God can now begin to place something new in my hands so that I can continue to walk faithfully with God in doing what He designed me for. And uh, if, if you ever try to hang on to something too long, it will become a weight and baggage to you. If, uh, let's just say, uh, back in the day when I remember I was driving towards Jim Cumber's house, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said, I need you to quit working for farmers. And I'm thinking, but that's what's in my hand, Lord. That's, that's what you've given me. That's what you've offered me, and it's been a great thing, and why would you want me to let go of that? And he says, I just need you to quit doing it. So I did it, and within two months, Ryan Iverson from Cooperstown, Funeral chapel called and said, Would you come on staff with us? So instead of touching just a few farmers here, I now have 150 miles of people I'll begin to connect with through the funeral business, of which I had no idea was coming. You see, so sometimes what's in your hand can be the, the blessing of what God put there, but if you hang on to it too long, it can become a hindrance of where God wants you to go. So make sure that you're willing to let go of whatever God, whatever's in your hand. And once again, the work that I did with farmers and others, it wasn't bad. God is not saying what was in your hand was bad. It's just that he's used that for his length of time he needed it. Now he's ready to put something different in your life. So that you can now begin to walk complete into what God wants you to do. So now I want you to turn with me, if you would, to uh, Leviticus chapter 6. Leviticus chapter 6. Real quickly, I just I just got I'm just I'll probably share this scripture and I, I'm not sure I'll do much part. Good news is I have nursing home, so you're out of here anyway. <coughs> Leviticus chapter 6, look at verse 8. Read with me. The Lord said to Moses, Give Aaron and his sons this command. These are the regulations for the burnt offering. The burnt offering is to remain on the altar hearth throughout the night till morning. And the fire must be kept burning on the altar. The priest shall then put on his linen clothes with linen undergarments next to his body, and shall remove the ashes of the burnt offering that the fire has consumed on the altar, and place them beside the altar. Then he is to take off these clothes and put on others, and carry the ashes outside the camp to a place that is ceremonially ceremonially clean. The fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. Every morning, the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat of the fellowship offering on it. The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. So under the Old Testament law, this was regulation for the priests. They had responsibilities that were different than everybody else. When you accept Jesus Christ, we're going to shift to the New Testament now. When you accept Jesus Christ, who comes in your life? Jesus, the light of the world. 
who now becomes the priest of your temple? You do. What is your job? The fire must never go out. Because if it goes out, it was the priest's responsibility. Isn't that interesting? So I'm the priest of my house. If my light goes out, I can't blame you. If I overdo it and work too much, I can't blame you. If I tell God, take a hike, I don't care about you anymore, I can't blame you. The only one I can look at is myself, realizing I'm the priest of my house. It is my job to say, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And if it doesn't, it's your fault. Because God made you a priest of your own house. So once again, if Jesus is the light of the world, and he never walked in darkness, when I invite Jesus Christ into my life, the only thing that really will help me continually stay lit is to stay away from darkness. And let Jesus shine. That doesn't mean I can't affect the darkness or be around the darkness. That just means what I let in is really crucial because all I need is a wind of the enemy going na 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 and it can blow you out and you'll, you'll lose your fire. The fire, you need to keep fed and every day the priest would go in and they would check those candles so that they would never wax up or build up to where it would go out. Isn't that interesting? So as a priest of my own house, I have this responsibility to make sure I stay lit for Jesus. I stay, I stay ablaze. I stay alive. And the only way I know that God's Word tells me to do, to, to have, let that happen, is to stay in God's Word every single day. Feed yourself. Feed that candle. Let the candle be filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God that brings life. Because if Jesus is the, the vine and we are the branches, have you ever seen Him die? No. So the only reason we would die is if we disconnected from Jesus. The only reason our life would go out is if we disconnected from Jesus. And I guarantee you, God does not want you or me going out. He wants us to burn bright. So be a good priest and take care of your house. And be careful what you let in. Be careful who you hang with. Be careful what you do, because if your candle goes out, it can be reignited. We know that, but it comes at an expense. It comes at a price. But it also comes at a price if you keep it lit. And here's what, think about that. When everybody else wants to go do this, this, and this, and God says, you don't get to go, that's a part of the price. If there was anything I hated as a kid, being the last of six kids, I hated being left out. Oh, school does today. <laughs> in an odd way, that will stir up inside of me, and I will, oh, I hate that about myself. So I have to continue to kill that part. So I just have to know that I'm not left out when I'm right where God wants me to be. I've got to get God's perspective rather than my own fleshly perspective. And so as a priest, I have to once again make sure that I stay in lit with the Holy Spirit. I have oil in my lamp. Don't be like the five foolish virgins that started with oil and didn't end with oil and ended up in hell. Did you catch that? They started with oil. They didn't end up with oil. Where did they go? They didn't go to heaven. So you want to make sure that you're lit for Jesus Christ. And by the way, is God really that bad of a deal that you don't want to stay lit? Is He really that bad? Not a chance. 
He is so amazing and so wonderful. We just got to continue to get our flesh out of the way and let God do what he wants to do in us. And I guarantee you, you'll enjoy it. So let's pray. Father, this morning, I pray that each and every one of us, once again, will grow and protect the light that you live in us when we got saved. Lord, you want to feed that light and let it burn bright. And I pray, Lord God, that if there's anything that the Holy Spirit needs to reveal in us today, I pray that our eyes and our ears are open to hear what is canceling or snuffing out the light that is within us. And Lord, I just pray that we will continue to protect that light and be a good priest in our own house and watch it continue to burn until you come back or we die in this whole world and go to heaven. So Lord, thank you for being so good to us and giving us the Holy Spirit, giving us the light so we can see where we're going and know where we're going. And Lord, I just pray that others around us will see that light and come to know you and it, it'll bring joy to our heart knowing we stayed lit for Jesus. Even if everybody else canceled out, we stayed lit for Jesus and we were doing exactly what you designed us for. So Father... I thank you, Lord God, that each and every one of us will guard that light, that candle that's burning inside of us, the work of the Holy Spirit, so that we too can uh, be ready when you come back. Because you are coming back. And you're coming back for those that are waiting for you, ready for you. And Lord, I pray that we're not like the five foolish virgins that weren't ready. But we're like the five wise virgins that had enough oil 